Welcome to the Andrew D'Angelo podcast. Constant Constance. Each week, Andrew, renowned jazz saxophonist and brain cancer survivor, invites us to look at the many worlds of his guests with conversations that cover all the arts, human resilience, a little bit of politics, and a lot of humour. You can't fail to have a fantastic time. Hey everyone, how are you doing today? I'm here with my friend Brian Tate who is a uh, musician, singer, artist, and dare I say, lyricist. I mean, you are a lyricist, right, Brian? I mean, yes. I'm probably a lyricist more than any of those other things. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And uh, I'm, I, I first met you, we, well, I didn't first meet you then, but we did a project, or you had me do a project with you, which, by the way, oh, I got it. I still have the brain. The brain, man. Yeah, my brain, man. That's we awesome. The project with the Queen's uh, Council on the Arts, right? Is that what it yeah. was? Yeah. Uh, Crossing Arts. What was that called? What? Uh, Queen's Art Express 2012, QAX 2012. And uh, this was a big um, uh, borough-wide celebration of everything that's great about Queen's culture. Uh, the art, the food, the people. And um, they brought me on to basically develop that idea and put something together. And um, so what I put together was this, uh, you know, this festival that focused, uh, that highlighted four neighborhoods. So three, three or four neighborhoods, but celebrated the entire borough. And um, in each of the, showcase neighborhoods uh we did a project called what if we made a new world it was imagine the world if artists decided public policy wow. and you were part of the um so in long island city we did a night uh and we created these collaborative teams of artists i love doing that yeah uh in long island city we did a night that uh, asked uh, what if artists decided um, economic policy that would be amazing. That would be so amazing. That 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 was and that night was was hot. That was with uh, Chanel Kennebrew, Leslie Alfin, uh, Teresa Burns, and Toshi Reagan, and each of them had an area in this space where they did work around if artists decided uh, economic policy, and then out in um, in Jamaica. To, to Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. We have four other artists, um, Carlos Martinez, uh, Anna Jensen, uh, Queen Goddess, um, and uh, uh, Ruang Ha. Um, and they did a piece around if artists decided um, uh, housing policy. So you were part of the group it was out in um, Flushing, right, and in Flushing. Gallery, and yeah, a gallery was... called Crossing Arts. Yeah, right in Flushing. And, um, and that night was what if artists decided uh, healthcare policy? Right. And that was you, and that was uh, Teresa was on that too, I think. No. No. Uh, Are you sure? Okay. No. That was you. That was uh, DJ Reka. Uh, that was um, well. Don't yell at me. I, I just thought Teresa was on it. That's all. You're like, no, man, no, no. Well, I'm just saying. That's what I thought. That was uh, you came out to the thing in Long Island City. Okay. And you saw Teresa perform, which she enough. was like the money tree thing, and she was like, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. All right, correct. Scan corrected. But geez, uh, that was you, Ocean Morrison. Oh yeah, uh, Ocean. Yeah, Ocean. Uh, I was Ocean. Lisa, now, Lisa Jesse Peterson came in at the end uh, and she did the thing around, you know, like the uh, holistic, uh, uh, holistic uh, food lady who was advising people to poop throughout the day or something. And also, uh, it was you, Ocean, Lisa, and DJ Raker. And uh, that was a killer night. And so you did the thing with the brain, right. with the brain to play music. All of y'all did phenomenal stuff, man. 
but we didn't know each other then. I, I did a bunch of research to find the right people, you know, for this idea. And, um, you know, it's funny, I hadn't thought about this before right now, Andrew, but it's also very similar to how I write music, but I'll, we can talk about that later, but um, yeah, go ahead. I researched and found you and I was like, this cat's amazing, you know, um, and your music and, and, you know, I was immediately like Andrew D'Angelo. It's a bad mother F, man. We got to get this guy. And he had fucking brain cancer. So there's that, right? I mean, <laughs> I went through the healthcare system, you know, like in a, like some kind of, uh, what do you call it? A, some kind of, you know, I don't know, like filter or something. I it went through so fast. It just all happened so fast for me. I was like, I had never been to the doctor in 20 years. I hadn't been in the hospital really ever. And then all of a sudden here I am, you know, just like in it and then I'm out of it. And then all of a sudden I'm doing this project and I'm making a brain. I'm putting my hand over here because I'm, because the brain is over here just so everybody knows I can't see it, but it's over here. And uh, what, I, I, I'm part of Medicare for all at this point, force the vote. Do you know anything about that or? No. Oh, uh, well, most countries have health care for everybody. You don't have to have insurance. It's just all a part of living. And so we're doing our best to bring health care to everybody in the U.S. So we don't have to pay our insurance, whatever it is, 500 bucks a month. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I was, and part of it was your project, by the way, I sent them your, uh, a video or a, maybe it was an article from that project. Yeah, there was, we got good press. I think yeah. there was TV and, and print. Yeah. Right. I, I, all of a sudden I'm spacing. I didn't know we were going to go here, but it's, uh, anyway, and uh, Shreek and uh, all these people at Medicare for All and Jimmy Dore and everybody is, just like why, you know, in your when you go to Europe or you know, Canada or wherever, you know, if you have to go to the doctor, you just go to the doctor. You don't have to worry about well, your copay is twelve thousand dollars or whatever the case may be. So interesting. Uh, so we were talking about Medicare for all and the how we met, but what I guess I didn't realize at the time is your band trying. For the Black Madonna is really fucking good. And I love that drummer. Who is that drummer? You sent me those videos. Who's playing drums? Do you remember? I don't remember his name. Okay. That's, that's embarrassing. That's but bad, let me, man. Like, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Max. Our what? founding drummer, the drummer who co founded the band. Yeah. Unreal. Hmm. Unreal. Woman out of Switzerland and very into um, uh, like Latin music, Latin beats. She brought so much flavor and like just deftness to what we did. And we played with her for a long time and then. Um, Is there a name? Met it. Met it Kohler. Okay. And then she, um, you know, she started a family. And um, uh, and as she was uh, pregnant with her second her second daughter, um, you know, it seemed like the wise thing to return to Switzerland after the years of being in New York City. Uh, so we spent a long time trying to find another drummer. We're, we're a bit unusual, I've learned, in New York City because you know we're like an actual band. You know, like this is the band. Uh, and it's not like straight people and, you know, pick up people, nothing against that. It's just not, it's not the culture that we come out of. So um, me and the guys, man, we meet every week. When we were first playing, particularly when Meta was in the, in the group, you know, for years, we would rehearse like three times a week. Wow. You know, and, um, and then just go out kill it, come back, rehearse, you know, writing. <laughs> and, and nice. And then, you know, 
we had that, you know, implosion period that all creative forces do and uh, didn't see each other, didn't engage for a long time uh, until after I had heart surgery, which is a, something else that you said made me think about that. And then after that, we all got back together and, um, and recorded some stuff and then met it. Had, that's when she was having a family, raising a family and she had to split. So then we spent like a long time trying to find a drummer. We could not and, um, and did a couple of shows with that cat. And he was good. I liked him, you know. Um, uh, but it was, you know, season, not a reason. And um, ultimately, though, um, we found our new drummer, who is like, like, right there, man, Don McKenzie. Which I say lovingly, crazy ass Don McKenzie. That's my brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and <laughs> nice. Uh, no, I mean you know. Don is I Don is a killer. Don yeah. is a killer, like a monster player, like just a, a monster player. And I grew up listening to drummers, you know, and you know Tony and Blakey and and Don is a monster drummer who can do most anything. And um, we uh, did a couple shows with him and had some more lined up. And um, then pandemic, that was, so, but the, but the larger thing is after, after being with these guys, my brothers, every week, you know, for years, See, after the three times a week thing, and then we stopped playing for a minute. And then when we got back together, we would just see each other once a week. And when we get together once a week, we just sit around, you know, half the time we're just sitting around bullshitting, you know, and talking smack at each other, about each other, whatever else. And then the last half of the session, we sit down and play some music. And it would just be like, because there was all of this chemistry, all of these years of like, you know, electric currents between us that it didn't take a long time to lay something out and just have it like come fully like whoo. So we would just meet once a week, man. And, but it was just so, it, it, you know, it was food for the soul, old expression, but it's so true. It, it's true. Now, and now, right. now, you know, uh, one of the things that's been most notable and tough for me about the pandemic is I can't, you know, I can't, be with my guys, you know, even just aside from the music, just, you know, sharing that space together, you know, anyway. Right. And, and I think that aspect, as you said, of being a band, as opposed to just hiring, you know, whoever for whatever gig. Yeah. Is uh, something I've talked to a lot of people about o over the years where you can tell when somebody is playing a show or at least I can, I, I believe I can. And they're just doing the gig, right? They're just trying to get through the gig because they're like, all right, this pays this amount of money. I just want to finish this thing up and, you know, get my paycheck. I'm sure I'm going to get some shit for that. Andrew, meaning, but I don't care. But so it's, I've also had that fortunate experience of having a band. So I understand that, you know, for 31 years, I don't know if people get so crazy about timing but it was like 30 something years and so i understand that where you're doing it for a reason and so you know when i heard the videos you sent me i mean i guess it was focused on you but i also really like the drummer but yeah maybe he wasn't listening maybe he just wanted to get through the gig he and was, what, no, he was cool yeah he but he cool. sounded really good to me and i was like if i could get this guy and play with him. And even if he didn't listen to me, like if he was like a metronome, it would still sound fucking cool. <laughs> you know, because I don't care. Yeah. 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 yeah you yeah. know what I mean? No, no, he was care. cool, man. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember his name, but of course I can't. It's remember. all right. I can't remember. <laughs> I don't either. These days. You know? Yeah. 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 So when it comes to when you're writing lyrics um, and that song, Stupid. 
or Come On Now. Those are two songs. Uh, I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, do you write the title? Do you remember those songs that I'm talking about? Right. And so are you, I'm assuming you wrote the lyrics for those. Or improv are you improvising them on the spot? So here's the thing. All those right. Two, Preach, man. Go ahead. So here's the thing. Those two songs. Those two songs. <laughs> Second are, time I got yelled at in this interview, by the way, folks. I'm just telling you. Anyway. Um, so here's the thing, man, is that uh, I grew up writing poetry. Oh, nice. And, you know, I would just sit with my notebook and I'd write poetry for days. Wow. And uh, I did that for years, you know, and, um, and I would perform poetry. And we just had a, a visitor enter the yeah, I know you just had a cameo, man. Photo bomb. All she, right. She's saying she's not here. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna hang up my head. So. Hey. Hey. What's up? Hi. I hey, I have a cameo with the light on my. I can't get it out. You of see, there. I put the Bowie and uh, Freddie Mercury's balls up in the. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. That's uh, anyway, so I would write poetry, man, and I was part of a uh, performance poetry group, of what they now call spoken word. Um, right. I was part of a poetry performance ensemble called Sabotage back in DC. And, you know, we would get up and do our thing. And so I, you know, wrote a lot of poetry. And at the point at which I decided I wanted to sing, um, I felt that uh, what I wanted to do was really focus on the musicality of the, 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 I wanted to focus on the, on the potential for musicality with my voice, not the words. I mean, that, that one would have to be foregrounded. And if one was going to be foregrounded, I wanted it to be the musicality of the voice instead of the words. You know what I mean? And Maybe for some people, they don't have to be foregrounded, but I think of somebody like, you know, and it's like I've studied a lot of writers and studied a lot of uh, musicians. It's, it's just something that I do. And so when I think of somebody like Dylan, for example, you know, and uh, studied a lot of Dylan, you know, the words for me are, are foregrounded. They're part of a whole. It's not that they're just out there on their own. They're part of a whole. You know, and those those songs, man, like Blood on the Tracks, that stuff is just like mind blowing. And the rhyme patterns and schemes that he would use there was just freaking mind blowing. On the other hand, you have somebody uh, who's also uh, deeply poetic, like Al Green, you know, who I also listened to up and down growing up, and even still. Right. Um, you know. Um, it's just different. I think that I think the folks have different relationships to um, the words, to the music, you know. So for me, who did not come from, you know, I never learned to play an instrument um, in my mind. And I emphasize this to not say that this is actual or factual. I'm just saying that in my mind, I had to choose what I was going to foreground if I wanted to like, you know, make music. And what I wanted to foreground was not my words, it was, mu it was the musicality, it was a delivery. Um, anyway, all of which is to say, I went down that path. And, um, you know, so what I, what I, once I started to figure out my voice, you know, my approach to the music, you know, um, once I finally started to like land on something after years of like, you know, started to figure something out. Um, the methodology that I uh, came upon, that I developed. And mind you, I just want to reiterate, I would spend, 
I'd spend an inordinate amount of time writing poems. I mean, so first of all, if you don't mind to explain to me, I, I, I don't care about my audience, but could you explain foreground? And when you say uh, in amount of, uh, 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 how much time are we talking about here? Eight hours a day, your every waking moment or? When you know. I was writing poetry, um, you know, I was younger, so I didn't have as many uh, commitments and distractions. Right. Yeah, I'd probably spend, um, could easily spend like six hours a day just, you know, writing cool. and thinking through, you know, what goes where. Uh, and I wrote some stuff that still lives, that's still alive for me today, you know. Um, once I started writing music, though, uh, what I came to as a methodology is that I would write out, I write out the vocal melodies, you know, like their horn charts. So you're actually notating that music? Only in my mind. Okay, fair enough. I, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is like, is this notated or is it just... For a while, I was notating it. The guys, it didn't, they could give a shit. It didn't make any difference. Right. Uh, <laughs> and it would take me so long to notate it, you know. Uh, but I would, you know, for a time, I was writing, like, for other instruments besides my voice, you know. And then I just decided, yeah, man, screw that. Let me just, anyway. So, um, so I write a vocal melody, you know. I have an idea for a song, I have a title. And then I write the vocal melody. And then I write the words to fit that melody. Interesting, okay. So, so instead that's your of- That's your process, right? Instead of what, um, uh, what it seemed to me that other people who would come to music to write poetry would do, is you write a poem and then you put the poem to music. And that foregrounds the poem, the, the, the lyrical content of the poem. I go the other route. I write the music and then I find, and then I create the poem to fall within the music. So the thing that made me think about that was uh, when we talked about how you and I met, I had a vision for what I wanted to do with that project. What if we made a new world, you know? artists to decide in public, public, decide in public policy. And I had several creative prompts, you know. Um, there was this commercial, uh, there was a TV campaign for, I can't remember the product now. That's because I can't remember them. Um, Sorry. But they did all these things about like, you know, what if roadies ran the world, you know? And, and, and what if uh, uh, this, you know, these kind of people ran the world, you know, what have you. But it was all to, it was, it was all advertisements to market their product. And it was like, oh, wow. But it was like, it was really convincingly done. And so I was thinking, oh yeah, man, what if artists like decide a public policy? So kind of riffed on that. And there were other points of, you know, there are other creative prompts up in there. But once I had this idea, once I had the title of the thing, what if we made it in the world, once I had an idea and how I would, you know, oh, we'll do stuff in these neighborhoods. And then this is how we solve the issue of presenting stuff across the borough. We'll do this big website. So I had all of these, like, I had this uh, infrastructure. Right. Then I had to have people who could give it life because otherwise it's just ideas. So that meant researching and finding, if we're talking about healthcare, who are, who are artists who are, um, who are artists who are doing stuff around that? Yeah, but why not? That's how I found why it. not? Just, why not just do it yourself? That's what I I don't know. It's do like, mean? well, why not just, you know, take your band, your project, your lyricism, your poetry, and do it yourself. You seem to be uh, have. Uh, I, I I dare I say, man, I I just think you have this ability to to help people collaborate, which is something I appreciate about you. And I still do even 
then 10 years later or whatever it's been eight years i don't know we can argue about the timing but it's just been amazing to watch you bring people together to collaborate to affect the world in a positive way and that's something i love about you and whether that's through your music and i, I i'm very curious if you've ever used your music to influence um, anti-racism or healthcare or you know you know anything like that because uh you just look man i just think you have this ability to bring people together that's what i think you have you can argue with me anybody else can be mad at me or whatever but i i'm, I'm just wondering if if because a lot of people make it singular, right? It's about me, man. I'm gonna like do it myself, man. I'm gonna, you know, ch make change myself. But somehow you're always just uh, putting your arms out there and hugging all of us. And mm -hmm. you were really nice to me. And I think you were really nice to Teresa and, and Ocean and everybody. And I, I don't know how they feel about it, but I was just like, oh, that was really a lovely experience, you know, that I'm holding on to with my brain. My brain over here, everybody, my brain, okay. my brain. And um, it's, anyway, I just wanna say thank you on some level, but also, oh. is that something that you do consciously or is it just like a organic yeah. response? You know? Both, both. I, 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 I'm compelled to do that. And and so is there like a voice in the back of your head going, man, you got to do this or, you know, like there when you're now. <laughs> right. What do you mean by that? Like things have changed or. Well. So. Uh, yeah, things, things have changed. I mean, things evolve. I think that for each person, particularly creative people, you know, your practice evolves. I think all of us evolved, you know. When I was first, when I first started doing this work, um, I'm wondering if I should close my window. Does it matter? Uh, it's okay for you. It. it the, the, I. I. I don't. It's not bothering me. But, okay, you know, that's cool. It's like so, ambient, ambient noise. So when I first started doing this work. Um, the work of you know creating platforms and creating um, stages and opportunities for people to you know come present. This felt like the most natural thing in the world to me, um, and it wasn't a question of. It's never been a question for me of uh, you know, oh let me put myself up there, you know. My mind just doesn't work that way, you know. When I was doing, uh, when I, you know, there, so like when I was doing the band and I would book shows, you know, for the band, I would always try to find other bands to create a show, create shows with, you know. And right. we invited a lot of bands on the shows. And, um, you know, I guess part of it is, I've always felt that the way to, to do something, to create um, create change or, you know, just really be present is to punch above your weight, do something greater than yourself, you know, and be a part of something that's, that's bigger and greater than yourself. And that's part of the thing about being in a band, you know, like having a band. It's like you're part of something. It's like the part, each of the individual parts are like, you know, phenomenal, but the thing together, it's like combustible, you know? And, um, you know, I was listening to ACDC the other, other night, uh, walking down the street. I hadn't listened to ACDC in a long time. And I mean, it's like with the original singer, uh, Bon Scott. Right. And, um, uh, I was listening to Highway to Hell. And there's a line where he says, uh, hey, Satan, paid my dues, playing in a rocking band. <laughs> hey, mama, look at me. I'm on my way to the promised land. I'm on the highway to hell. 
<laughs> fucking poetry, man. But it's an idea of like, yeah, man, pay my dues, singing in a rocking band, you know. So that idea of like being a part of something greater than oneself. So the projects are an extension of that, you know, it's like, and I see so much greatness in other people, you know. I mean, I, I saw so much greatness in you just reading about you and then when we met and all of that, and it's just like, oh man, this dude. You know, the other thing I should tell you is that I grew up reading comic books, Marvel comic books, you know. Okay. So as a boy, I was exposed to like, you know, old school, man, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, you know, those early stages of like Fantastic Four and the X-Men and the Avengers and all of that shit. So some part of me processes people in that way, you know? So it's like when I meet people who have like a certain kind of, um, it's not, and it's not just like an energy or a charisma, you know? Um, a demeanor or something like that? Not to put words in your mouth, but no. No, no, no. All right. Third actually, time I've been corrected on the show, ladies and gentlemen, but okay. Actually, some of those things I'm a bit like Brian. wary of. Okay. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I can be a bit wary when like... What the hell's bit, going on over there? It's, a, you know, Brooklyn. I can be a bit <laughs> wary when people... Uh, uh, well, let me just say that I'm not talking about persona. You know, I don't really care about persona. I'm just talking about being open to and attuned to a person's sense of, of values and, and um, yeah. So, and each person's values are like, you know, are expressed and held in different ways. And so when I met you and same, and same when I've met other people, it's just like, oh, wow, man. You know, that cat is like freaking, you know, fucking Cyclops, man. But it's like in this sort of mythic narrative, like, you know, comic book kind of way. And it's like, oh shit. So to me, the most natural thing in the world is, oh yeah, man, let's, you know, let me do everything I can to help like train that light on this cat, man. And, and oh, and maybe bring, him together with her and with him and like fuck man it's fucking amazing you're like a, you're like a connector as i say like you're one of those people that brings people together and i mean if that's fair and like i mean mike if i had a comic book narrative be like don't fucking fuck with my fucking brain i do the fuck what i want you motherfuckers fuck you i get to have my lamps in the background i can have my hair long i can have the light the way i want fuck you Right? Damn. And Brian, you let me do what I want to do. And I think that's one of the things I love about you is you're like, all right. So that was kind of a rant. Sorry, I did a rant. I apologize. I did a rant. No, look, man, I'm going to tell you, um, you know, the projects that I do, I don't talk about them before they're cooked because, you know, I like that JB thing, kill them and leave. It's like you bring this shit out and it's like, bang. bang. You know, so <laughs> um, nice. But I, but I also I also you know the other time I talk about my projects is if I've decided not to do them. Uh, so I'm going to cheat this a little bit because I've had two projects that I've had you in mind for, man. Uh, and I'll share one of them because I just don't know if I can, I don't know that I can do it. And I haven't, and I haven't actively thought about it for a while, but uh, I wanted to do a thing with you. Um, and I want to say it was called Anthem, but it, it might've had a different title. I think it did have a different title, but it was, um, I wanted to commission you. I wanted to have you commissioned to create a piece of work for the 9-11 Museum and to be like an artist in residence at the 9-11 Museum and to create this piece of work. Uh, it was not called Anthem, it was called, uh, 
whatever, dude. All I know about you is that you're you're fluid, and what that's one thing I loved about you is like if somebody wants to change the title of their project or like you know shift over here, which I did, I can speak to myself, but I also think other people in in the QAX project we did the Queens project where people were like, yeah, I think I want to call it something else. You're like, all right, that's cool. You, you're, you're always cool with that. So I'm not surprised that you're not nailing, you know, the titles of these things. Cause I think you're open to people being okay with, all right, you're an artist. What do you want to do now? I, I think the reason I'm not nailing the title of the thing is cause my mind is like gone. But <laughs> I don't think it is. I don't but, think your you mind know, I was is talking gone. With a friend, I was talking with a, a friend a couple of days ago, uh, a visual artist uh, was telling me about a grant process, you know, and how they want letters of recommendation just in the course of the application, you know, and how he felt that this was just so like, it's, it's fucking bullshit, man. You know, you got to go to people over and over We write a letter of recommendation for and I said, you know what? Listen, man, you can come to me a hundred times. It's never, it's never too much. Right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You're cool but, with that. But, but I do want to say, you get this foundation, you know, arts foundation, and you require every applicant to submit letters of reference from, you know, letters of recommendation from three different people. And you get like, you know, however many applications you get, a shitload, you know right away, okay, this part, these people are out because of some technical thing or some, you know, whatever. But 40% of these people are out. Okay, now let's look at the work. Okay, so 20% of these people, it just ain't there. Either it's not what we're looking for or you know, we don't feel that it's at a certain level, so they're out. So now it comes to like a hardcore competitive thing about, you know, 30%, maybe maybe it's 15% of the people. Why not require those people to write, to, to gather these letters? Why put artists through all of these freaking hoops right. for something that's never even going to get to the, get through the gate? Right. And I'm just like, you know what? You have the money. Write the artist a check. And this whole question of well, what are they going to do with the money? Write the check to the artist. Yeah, they're going to pay. They're going to pay rent and pay the bills. Whatever they're going to do is going to be the right thing. So just get out of the freaking way. Create the opportunity. Whatever you're doing, if yes. it's bread, if it's a stage, if it's visibility, and get out of the effing way. Uh, it, it's funny because when you think about it, if let's say just just as spitball there's like 10 people that apply and they have to get three recommendations so that's 30 pieces of whatever each panelist has to read right and they're not even going to read it because if the exactly person doesn't, if the person doesn't match up with what they're looking for exactly and it's like in the end what is it for a grand maybe 10 grand you know whatever oh, it's the other side of it yeah then you got to do all of this like bullshit reporting and so forth and i'm just Correct. like Write the people a check. Just write, right? <laughs> Just write the fucking check. Oh my God. So my feeling, my feeling about like artists, when I engage artists and stuff I'm doing, it's like, here's a big picture. What are you gonna do? Do you think? How can I be in service right. to that? God and God bless you for that. I mean, my own mom early in, in uh 2020 in the pandemic, she's like, Can I send you some money? I'm like, sure. So she sent me a grand, right? And so there was my phone bills, like a hundred bucks. My internet's like a hundred bucks, you know, my rent, that's it. Money's gone. I was like, thanks for, you know, I mean, thank you, mom. God bless you. But it, uh, I, I, and it's my mom. I didn't have to prove anything to her, right? I didn't have to write a grant or anything. What, am I being too exposing here? No. <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck is wrong with this world? It's so uh, look, weird. I, I, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. And I want to use my words slightly. I want to be slightly discreet. 
Not too much, but slightly discreet. Okay. So I brought you into something else. And the situation got all fucking crazy. And we've okay. never really talked about that. Are you talking about the Greenwood Cemetery thing? Yeah, that's what I was trying to be discreet about. But that's fine. Yeah, the Greenwood Cemetery thing. But you know, like, here's the thing is that, and, and that's a perfect example of like, I had this vision. I had this vision as soon as I saw the cemetery. It's like, wow, effing amazing. So, you know, I was met with hundreds that were, um, I think, in all fairness, outside of anybody's control, you know. And uh, it had only to do, you know, largely to do with me. You know, I just started this gig, which was like the first time I'd worked a gig, gig in a long time. And that was different. And also, you know, my mom had just passed and I hadn't, I hadn't factored in until later. Oh, this is one of the reasons I was so attached to doing this thing in the cemetery. I hadn't really put that together then. But it's a case where uh, my, my response to artists doing stuff is as we've discussed. Some, I, you know, one of the things that I learned on that gig was that um, some, sometimes a presenter, that's not where their head is, you know? And they have their own set of like, you know, we need this to happen this way. We need that to happen that way and so forth and so on. So that were, you know, there were some things that in the course of that, of that gig, there were some really beautiful, gorgeous things that happened, but there were other, there were other just aspects of it that were, um, that were outside of how I like to do things, you know? And um, yeah, so I just want to tell you that I loved what you did with that thing. I don't know if I ever told you. The first night that you did that, man, I just sat there in the front row and I was crying. You know, I mean, I was literally crying. And it was just so like, uh, and you played this thing that you've recorded. It was maybe a thing for your uncle. Um, I love you, is that what you're talking about? Probably. Uh, and I just and, and, and it's like when I'm when I'm like doing a gig, I'm constantly on the move. I'm like moving all the time. It's only it's only recently in the last few years that I have tasked myself to stop being a service. Everything is set up. Just sit down and take this in. And I did that in your set, that first or second night that you did it, man. I just and I was just freaking weeping. Um, so I thought, yeah, I thought the stuff you did was completely fucking beautiful. And I thought that whole thing, it had such, it had such power to it. And, um, you know, um, I would love to have a space like that where I could be completely like, what you described about my process, but that wasn't that room. And and I didn't and I didn't fully I didn't fully understand the degree the degree to which they um, were operating in a different lane until we were like pretty far down the lane. So you know it happens that way. Live and learn. I mean I live and learn. I uh, I've actually been in contact with Greenwood Cemetery about that concert recently, maybe two weeks ago, about uh, on Twitter, and uh, wow, I showed them some photos and they were super psyched. But yeah, that's anyway. great. Let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else that's really important to me. Okay, is when I go into like institutional doors, you know like big institutional doors, which I do a fair amount. You know, I enjoy that. Um, and I'm there for a purpose, you know, I'm there to like do the people's work. But one of the other things that I do, that I always try to do is I try to open doors 
for other people to come in. Come on in, come on in, come in, in you know, and create their own relationships. Hey, this is so-and-so. Do you know so-and-so? They like to do this killer shit. Hey, so-and-so, this is, you know, to like the big wigs at the whatever this institution is. You need to know Andrew. You need to know Ed. He's this killer photographer. He's going to take all the photos for our thing. You need to know so-and-so. So, -and -so, -and -so. So that when I leave, which is inevitable, other people have their own relationships now and can like do shit. It's good for everybody that way. So I'm glad to hear that you're in contact with Greenwood and I hope y'all do something because that would be like, that would be like the grandest win for me out of that, <laughs> out of that freaking gig, man. I don't know if they're gonna invite me to do something. Do you know the story? Did I ever tell you the story about my, my cell phone that night, my mobile phone? So it was the last night we played there, okay? And I don't know if that was the greatest night of, of my personal set with you. Uh, I think Vernon Reed sounded great every night. But uh, so anyway, I lost my cell phone. Oh. And, I don't know. and I, because I wandered through the cemetery and found an exit and got a car service and went home. And I got home and I realized I lost my my mobile phone. And I was like, oh shit. And only because my neighbor's like a hundred years old, I need my phone to stay in touch with her. So I walked to the cemetery. It's about maybe nine in the morning or something like that. And I talked to the guy at the gate and I say, Hey, I, I played a show here last night. And he looks at me like, what are you talking about? You played a show here last night, right? And I, 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 I think I left my phone. Remember you had those tents set up, the kind of temporary tents? Yeah, the hospitality he, tents. And I said, but I don't remember exactly where, because you had somebody take us up in a golf cart or whatever it was. So I, I, I don't yeah. know how to get there. Yeah, 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 he yeah. goes, just walk up there, you'll find it. So I walk up there, whatever that means, and I'm walking on the grass and stuff. And then there's my phone. I found my phone. Wow. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. And the guy, the guy at the gate was literally, I mean, in his 60s, understandably, no problem. But he was like, what the hell are you talking about? But then he goes, just, uh, you know, walk up there. You'll find it. I was like, walk up there where? He goes, just over there. And I just walked and walked and then I found it in the grass. I found my phone, which, you know, phones are like a thousand dollars these days or whatever, 800 back then or something. But I have a, a serious bond with that. that That's magical, uh, man. It's it a was, magical place. I think it's magical. And I put that on the, the Greenwood Cemetery website and I got no responses. I was like, that's kind of depressing. I thought it was kind of a cool story, but you know, whatever. Maybe they think I'm making it up, but I'm not. But you know, I think that, I think that, uh, uh, I think that there's magic in places, there's magic in people, there's magic in moments. Agreed. You know? And when there's an opportunity to combine those things, it's a really powerful thing. But just even, you know, it doesn't have to be on some big grand level. I, you know, I, I, I lean towards big grand shit, but uh, it doesn't have to be on a big grand level. You know, if we could shift gears just for a minute at the end of the show and talk a little bit about racism in America. And here we are in the crux of the Derek Chauvin trial of the murder of Charles Floyd and then also the Dante, George, Floyd. Uh, George Floyd. Sorry, I was getting confused, man. There's a lot of people been murdered. I, I you know. Is, yeah, I don't know if Charles Floyd names. was ever dealt uh, and, cool. and Dante Wright. And then I grabbed this quote for, from something you sent me. Why should it be up to people of color to educate me about racism? That sounds exhausting. If there are white folks around who can get me started and keep me grounded. Uh, I don't really is that, understand is what that, that means. From Dan James? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. here I am talking to a person of color about racism. So there's that, you know. Uh, okay, that's fine. I mean, should I be talking to other white people about racism or I don't know? 
Um, I don't think there's any reason you shouldn't be. Okay. And I do. And that white person said, were you always aware of your black identity? Has that identity changed over the years? This is something that a white person said to you for you Correct. to answer me. Correct. Direct question to you after several phone calls and okay. texts and stuff like this. Um, t- tell me the question again. Was I always aware of my black identity? or, did, or is that Were you that- always aware of your black identity and has that identity changed over the years? Wow. Well, mm. I want to answer your question, but I also want, and I'll say, and instead of, but I also want to, um, uh, address something that is, um, it may be separate and apart from the question, but it's part of a, a larger context for me from which the question springs. Okay. So let me respond to your question. Have I always been aware of my black identity? Uh, one word answer is yes. Uh, the next answer is, um, you know, I'm in a society, we all are, in which um, race is one of the defining uh, characteristics of, of who gets to live, who gets to die, who gets to um, enjoy, who, who's made to suffer. I mean, so many of those things are defined by race. They're not defined uniquely by race. The race is up there. Race may be, it may be, um, it's like it's right in the core material, you know. So have I always been aware of my race? Uh, But that wasn't the question. The question was, I always been aware of my race, of my black identity. Um, You know, my blackness is not, it's not an idea. It's not an identity, and I don't want to parse this too closely, like into a thing of semantics, because I don't know that that's what the person who asked you to ask me that question meant it. But I'm going to take it this way just for a minute. It was a white female, straight female. That's that's fine. Um, it's not. It's not a. Um, it's not an identity. I mean, so this this kind of circles back to the discussion we were having that we touched on briefly about persona, you know which is a term I brought into the conversation in which I said that um, I'm not responding to people's personas. I'm responding to their essence, you know, is what I want to be attuned to with someone's essence. And, um, you know, and I also said that I can be a bit wary of people who have a certain, you know, um, how can I put this? Shouldn't I say qua? <laughs> well, you know what? But, but see, if that's part of an essence, then it's just then it's like a beautiful thing. If it's something that, that's adopted for a purpose, you know, if I if I can be like you know this person, then I can you know acquire this. Or if I'm that kind of person, I can get right. her or him. Or you know, if I'm this, you know, th- those are things that I associate with 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 the. With the persona, and and from a an artistic standpoint, particularly from a music a musician standpoint, which you know typically involves performance, I'm very like sensitive to when I see, especially singers who are performing, and it's like all of this like shine is on them, and it's like. And it's just different strokes with different folks. I'm talking about myself here. That um, I want to, I want to like be in the company of people who give, not people who take. Anyway, so I'm equating 
I'm connecting, and this may not be at all what your friend intended with her question. No intention, uh, open question. I'm, I'm connecting identity with- She's married to a black man, and she was like, I just wanna know what he has to say, that's it. Okay, you taking this deeper and deeper, but let me, let me just stay in this lane for a second. Um, I'm equating, and perhaps unfairly, I'm equating identity with persona. Okay, um, and I'm distinguishing persona from essence. Okay, my persona is something that I could change. My essence is who I am. My identity is not a, um, you know, my blackness is not an identity. It's, you know, it's who I am. It's 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 cooked in with the with the uh, you know with the lasagna. It's like it's all there. And I would go so far as to I would I would add to that. You know, have I always been aware of my black identity? Um, I've always been aware of my um, uh, uh, my identity as a as a boy and then a man. Um, I've been aware of my identity. Um, there's certain things that, you know, I became more aware of over time, but like being an able-bodied person. I mean, our society is divided in such a way that there's a hierarchy. You know, if you are white, if you are man, if you're straight, if you're able-bodied, if you have a certain physical presentation, um, you know, those five things, you're already over here, you know? So for people who, who are not within that camp, uh, and particularly when the other people, um, when the people who are in that camp have, have created the society in such a way that everybody else is made to be less, is to have less, and to think of themselves as less, and to be, you know, whatever, whatever. Just all of that myth, the myth of white supremacy. Um, I think that we're always, everyone is aware of who they are. Um, I have no illusions about that. And, and not only am I aware of it, uh, I embrace it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be who I am, every aspect of who I am. I also have a tremendous amount of empathy and curiosity about other people and their conditions and their sense of self. L let me interrupt just for a sec. But, but she was more asking, I mean, since you were a kid, you had that awareness or did it change over time? That was more of a question, maybe. Maybe I got more di more direct with my the question because I wrote it down in a way. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, when you're like five, I, I, do you understand that? Or when you're like ten or fifteen, you know, or twenty-five? Or I mean, you know, let me address something that I think is universal about children. I think that up until, I don't know, there's probably an age, I'll just tell you the age that comes to mind for me, up until like seven, eight, maybe while you're still like in the single numbers as a general, with lots of variation across people and whatever. Okay. The world you see is the world it is. There's no questioning of it. This is the world. And um, and for hopefully, if you're in the camp of, you know, what I hope to think is a good number of people, the world is good, man. You know, now, as you get older, you may see, oh, shit, man, we were like dirt poor. Or, uh, oh, shit, it's not normal to, like, get your ass kicked every day. Or, <laughs> you know... Oh God, you know, other people like, um, 
they like have food, they have like meals like two or three times a day. Whatever it is, whatever the thing yeah. is, whatever. Right. But when you're young, wow, you know, it's not like that for everybody, not by far, but for a good number of children in America, at least, I think, I hope. Uh, you know, the situation you grow up in is the situation you grow up in. The life you grow up in is the life you grow up in. And it's and it's not a comparing against this or that because the fuck you a child. So as a child, as a yeah, black yeah, child. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. As a as a black child, I mean, um, you know, I I grew up in a household with my parents who were very, you know, my parents were freedom fighters. They were very active in civil rights movement, black power movement, uh, pan-African movement, black nationalism. Um, and not in an abstract, a cere in a cerebral way, although in that way also, but I mean in a real activist way. And um, so I grew up surrounded by um, examples and thinking and books and images of black empowerment and black pride, you know. Um, it was just the most natural thing in the world to me. But I also think that just taking that aside, you know, I grew up reading comic books. I grew up watching horror movies. I mean, it was just the natural, most natural thing in the world to me. And it wasn't like, oh, you know, other people aren't watching movies where, you know, Dracula is decapitating somebody. <laughs> you know, I, I I watch those movies all the time, and you know, it's just it's just it's just growing up. I mean, I, I I guess from from my side, like it just seems like there should be no reason for a child to have to think about this shit. And then my friend, uh, and again, I did a good job of keeping this away from you because I wanted to like put you on the spot and I'm sorry, you don't seem angry. So you seem cool. And it's just like, I mean, she's, she was just curious. Like, I mean, did your identity change as you grew well, up? Well, so let me, let me, let me address, let me, let me, let me go to the other part of this though. Yeah. What, for what, sure. I, said, what I said was, um, you know, what I think is a larger context from which the question springs. Okay. Um, so two qualities that are hugely important to me, two values that are hugely important to me in my life uh, are empathy and curiosity. And in that constellation of values and, and feelings and so forth is also doubt and uncertainty, you know? And I have a real wariness, Andrew, for people who are like certain. That to me is like fucking yellow light flashing to red, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I have a, I place a huge value in doubt and uncertainty, you know? And I often say, like when I'm doing these projects, when I'm doing anything, what I know could fill a thimble. But I do have a tremendous amount of curiosity and empathy. And, and I never feel that there's anything wrong with asking about something, you know, that I don't know about. But I will tell you this. I think that it's imperative. This isn't where I was going to go, but I'm in this lane, so I'm going to stay in this lane for a second. Uh, I was doing a project um, with uh, to talk about uh, what the world was like, what America was like, what the future held for people who were gay um, after the 2016 election. And so um, I researched and found, you know, for gay activists, creative people, thinkers um, from different cultural communities and reached out to them the same way I reached out to you for that other project. Right. To say, hey, I want to do this public conversation. 
you know, would you come and talk about the work that you're doing? Would you come and talk about what you see happening in the world right now and what you see is coming up and so forth? And each one of these people said, yeah, you know. Um, another part of my uh, curatorial and my creative practice is that everybody gets paid. Right. I don't do shit if people ain't going to get paid. I don't have to be paid. But if I'm bringing anybody to the table, folks have to be paid. So when I'm reaching out to people, part of that conversation also is, here's the thing, here's the vision, here's where I'm coming from, and you're going to get paid. So I reached out to these folks and said, hey, would you all do this thing? And they, yeah, and everybody said, yeah, 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 yeah. And these aren't people who even know each other. It's just, you know, just the part You're of- Connecting people, that's what you do. Them. Yeah. So I wrote a curatorial statement to express, and I did a lot, you know, I wrote a curatorial statement to express my position as someone who's not gay, but not to express my position, to really, um, to really frame this issue and why this discussion was important, you know, in my mind. And so I wrote this curatorial statement and I shared it with the people who were going to appear on this, on this uh, panel. Right. Before I made it public. Say, so could you give me your thoughts about this? You know, because the fuck do I know? You know, I don't want to put something out there that's whack. It's got yeah, yeah, right. Like, wh what do you know? What do I know about you know r racism? I, I mean, what are, right? So I put this thing out. I sent it to them, and I said, "So this is a curatorial statement, it's like three paragraphs. I just want to, you know, please tell me, you know." And uh, folks got back to me and said, "Yeah, yeah, man. No, that's right on. Yeah, yeah, man. That's great. Yeah, yeah." And one person responded privately and she said, Brian, yeah, that, your statement, that was really good. Um, it's just one thing. I just want to, okay, yeah, well, what is it? Anything. She said, um, the part where you say that uh, people should not be um, uh, uh, persecuted or I can't remember the language that I use because of their, uh, because of their uh, gender preference, um, and I said, oh, okay. And I heard it, I heard it, gender preference. Because it ain't a preference. See, I'm outside of it. And the culture says it's a preference. Right. And in all innocence, I'm like gender preference. Which means that a person could prefer something else if they chose. You know, the way that somebody else might, I prefer to go to dinner here. So I'm, in all innocence, I'm using this language. It is a language of, um, it's not a language of humanity. It was innocent. I didn't know. So I said, and she said, it's just, you know, so this expression where you say gender preference, I got you. Now, that's not the, that's not, that for me, that's not the interesting part. Although that's interesting. Fortunately, because of another experience I had had, I had the presence of mind to say to her, because my, my next, the question I was about to ask is, what is the better way to say this? But I didn't say that. What I said to her was, let me research some things and come back to you with some other language. And she said, okay. And I researched, I did the work, I invested the time, I applied myself, and I came back and I said to her, so if this language said, oh, well, gender orientation, yeah, that's fine. Wow. Because what I did not do was make it her job to tell me what it's supposed to say. I'm supposed to do that work. If you, and I like it, I, I, put, it, I put it like this. If you're applying for a gig of any type, you know, in the straight world, what I call the straight world of, you know, people in offices and that shit, or in the, you know, the creative world, you know, the bent world, whatever you want to call it, you know, you want to get in a, you know, be on a show. You <laughs> Let's call it the curved, the curved world. How's that? I like that. <laughs> you know, like, hey, man, there's a spot in this band or there's a, you know, whatever it is. 
you do the fucking work. Right. You don't walk in and like, hey, I'm here. I'm entering, you know, so what is it that you all do? Right. Well, and how can I, how, so how can I fit in here? No, man. No. No. You serious? If you're serious about your empathy, you're serious about your, your curiosity, and especially if, you can, if you're serious about your desire to connect, your desire to demonstrate solidarity, you go off and do the work on your own. And then you come prepared. It's not to say that you're gonna know everything. No, you're not, hell no. But you're not gonna be making it a requirement of someone else to say, oh, so what should this say? Right. So, well, the reason that I say that, it, I don't say this at all as a, as a slider at all or a slap on your friend. No, but this, this is the work for me. But, 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 I, but, but, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that to me, when I asked, when I presented that uh, curatorial statement to those folks, and this sister said to me, uh, this part right here, I regard her as my sister, the way I regard you as my brother. Our family is like so big and vast, and there's so many different parts. And as it stretches further, further out, we got like people in Kentucky, we got people in fucking Tanzania, we got people like all over. I don't know what their experience is, but I know that we're connected. I know that we're connected. So the thing that's important for me is to always be mindful of our connection. And when I hear questions like, hey, did you always feel this way? Or did you know about it? it, it what it feels connected to me is a larger cultural context in this country, and not just in this country, but in the West, of a separation about you, what's your, so what's this like for you? See, what I'm interested in is the we. And there is a you and a me in the we, but it's right. not, you're not, we're not separated that way where you are having like, you know, you know, no man, I, I, I'm not interested in anything that has to do with spectator. I'm not interested in anything that has to do with the passivity or passiveness. I'm interested in, hey, I'm right up here with you. What can I do to be present? What can I do to be of service, et cetera? Well, right. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I guess I, I feel like <laughs> the horn. I feel like that's what you're saying is that we're, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I need to, uh, finish the interview because I have something to do at seven. So it's like, um, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to say. If you want to put words in my mouth, I, 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 I want I, you to say, you know, I'm not trying to get you to say anything. Right. I, I, I'm I, just sharing with you what my, what my philosophy is. Right. And, and that's why I was nervous about this conversation because I, I knew that you were going to go deep and that I'd be like, uh, what to say, except for, I agree with you. I think, but I don't know. I have to watch and re-listen to what you said to understand, you know, the complexity of what you're saying because I don't have the same experience as you. That's all. And it's not it's not the way I grew up. I grew up playing tennis and like in a country club and shit. Yeah, you know, I don't fucking know. You know what I mean? Like I didn't fucking pay attention to this shit. You know? Um Okay, well, um, you know, the thing is for me that I don't, you know, I, I guess to just speak frankly from a place of love, I, I could give a shit where anybody came from. It's all 
we all come from where we come from. We come from the situations and the lives and the relationships and so forth and everything. It's just a question of, is there a point at which a person becomes radicalized and understands that um, that the greatest investment we can make is in humanity. And it's not based on like getting shit or getting over or, or keeping other people over here, but you know, or, or fighting forces of change. It's about respecting and elevating and connecting with life, with like all of this like abundance of, of life, man. And, you know, and if that comes at a cost, that work, it's work, it's work that it comes at a cost. So, you know, for me, when a person becomes radicalized to that mindset, um, and to be more explicit, you know, when a person comes to a mindset that like, uh, oh, this person is nothing like me, and they are just as human and they're just as valuable as me. And whatever their ethnicity, whatever their gender, whatever their uh, uh, gender orientation, whether they have a you know incredible home or whether they're homeless, they're, this person is just as important and valuable. And not only are they that, not only are they just as, as, as valuable and as human as me, as invaluable and as human as me, but we're actually connected. Okay. All right. So I now have that awareness. Okay. That's a radical, that's a radicalization that, that, that that's not the, the drumbeat of much of the society and much of the culture. So it's a radicalization. And once you come to that, then the next question for me is, um, okay, you know, I respect everybody as like a person. I'm not holding hate, racism, misogyny, any of these things against anybody. I truly, you know, okay, great. Now, let's understand that this person over here, who I respect as a person and may even love as a person, you know, as an idea, even as a, even as a person, that their human experience may be completely different than mine because they can get stopped at a traffic light and killed. Right. That ain't gonna happen to me. So now that I know that, what am I gonna do about it? Now I can stay over here and be like, hey, I know I respect this person as a human being. I'm not harboring racism or anything. Okay, but what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about the fact that this person who I, you know, whether I know them or not, they can be pulled over and shot and killed and they're gone. Right. So am I prepared to, um, am I prepared to invest myself and address that issue. Yeah, am are I you? To, am, I have to be. And each of us has a different part to play for, for any number of reasons. I heard somebody break it down once and say that there are people who bring heat and there are people who bring light. Okay. okay. Right, okay. And in that regard, I'm in the light category. You know, I'm not in the heat category. It's not, I'm not made that way and I'm now I'm old as fuck and all of these other things. People who are out in the street bringing heat, more power. I have a, you know, I have my own part to play. And I'm true to playing that part. And I got other shit, man. I, I Look, listen, man, let me show you something. I still fucking sit around and read comic books. Right. <laughs> and enjoy cool. them. Yeah, cool. Man. And That's enjoy cool. them. <laughs> you know, right. But I also have no illusions about the fact that I, through whatever, whatever it is about 
me and the universe, whatever. You know, I get to create uh, relationships with, uh, you know, WNYC Radio, with the Guggenheim Museum, with uh, the Borough of Brooklyn, with yeah, the uh, Brainwood Cemetery. Right, you're good with that shit. This is, you know, but I have a purpose. Yeah. My purpose is to advance my views and beliefs and ideas about humanity and and equality and democracy and justice. And this is what I bring into any situation. Now, I still like to come home, read a comic book. I still, if somebody told me that there's like this incredible horror movie that's on, it's like a real horror movie and not a piece of shit. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Let's do it, man. I'm there. But yeah. the reality is that in the end, I also have this commitment. Right. All right. You're not going to let me. Talk. So anyway, go ahead. The reality of what? No, I mean, I, uh, I, I can't go much longer, Brian. I love you so much. So I, I usually at the end, if, if you've been kind of being brilliant this whole time is there anything you want to tell the world you know i don't know if there's like a final statement or something but um i mean you yeah, I got a statement come to my next thing which is uh this launches in like day after tomorrow in two weeks my next big project is called new american dream five weeks of virtual town halls on disrupting systemic racism and envisioning the nation beyond it. And uh, each week, each week we look at um, we look at uh, systemic racism, white supremacy, and uh, uh, state-sponsored xenophobia through a different lens. First week is around voting rights and political mobilization. The second week is around artificial intelligence and genetic data. The third week is around black journalism. The fourth week is around uh, white anti-racism. And the fifth week is around cultural narratives. And the people are talking amazing, as you know. You know. Yeah, um, cool. Uh, uh, my curatorial practice focuses on women. So 90% of these people are women. And this is, these people are, this is like the fucking X-Men and the Avengers and the Justice League all together in one thing. <laughs> it's going to be fucking major. So if, fucking so great your, commercial, man. Tell your people, come, go to, um, go to 13.org slash new American dream. This ain't even popped yet, man. Nobody has this information yet. The sites, everything is all built, but we haven't promoted it. Go to 13.org slash New American Dream. And there's like all of this information about all this shit. So it's from, it's from April 28th through May 26th on Wednesday nights, five o'clock live stream. And it's going to be fucking awesome. Bravo. Thank you, Brian. And love you, man. Thank you for being here today. Everybody, um, Brian uh -huh. Tate absolutely amazing and we love you and i can't wait to check out that stream that sounds amazing yeah man listen next time we powwow podcast whatever uh we should just talk about music because that's like a whole other thing right well we we talked about music yeah we, we talked about music yeah we can do it again we'll do another one when you come on we'll just talk about your uh, we did talk about uh, whatever all right love you brother well, i'll talk love to you later man. all yes, right peace, all right. peace. All right. thank all right. you but thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Constant Constance. Tune in every week for new conversations. And if you want even more, check out Andrew's Patreon for more exclusive content and additional conversations. Hosted and produced by Andrew D'Angelo. Edited and mixed by Lucy Little. Original music by Andrew D'Angelo and Maximilian Moore D'Angelo. Intro is Henrietta Weeks. Thanks so much. See you next time. You Sounds fucking beautiful. yeah, you fucking rocked it. Like you she doesn't. It. She doesn't know she says podcast, right? <laughs> like she doesn't even.